All right, welcome back everybody to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 108, and I have our my first three-time guest on here, Tom Lazat's with me today. TL, what's going on, my friend? Well, listen, uh, as the expression goes, uh, living the dream. Love it. And uh, Happy New Year uh, to all of you who are starting your uh, new school year. Thankfully, I'm retired. You're retired. <laughs> Not- yeah, for, for people who don't know you at all, <laughs> can you give us a, a brief rundown on what your... Uh, your teaching history and mentorship and all that is? Sure. I uh, taught uh, 32 years of high school band uh, in Massachusetts, Maine, uh, Connecticut, and Florida. I retired uh, pre-pandemic, and uh, I, since then have been uh, really busy in my retirement, which I very much enjoyed um, to be able to do different things, but things that are mostly in the realm of music and mostly in the realm of uh, lifelong learning which is really takes us to our subject today. Yeah, being a lifelong learner. Abs- absolutely. And yeah, uh, so you're the one who introduced me to the Ray Kroc quote that mm-hmm. I use as foundation for the whole podcast. So you get the ultimate trademark. It's not an elegant quote, but I think it really uh, states the point uh, very well. And and I think one of the exciting things about the, the profession, how we can continue to grow. When you think about it, uh, Stokowski was, was conducting into his 90s. Uh, William Ravelli, uh, got the Shula late in life, all of them just kept on going beyond the quote unquote normal retirement age, which I think is is pretty uh, a wonderful example, but also um, something that drives me. And um, so I, I wanted to spend a few moments today talking about lifelong learning. First, so we're kindred spirits precisely for mm-hmm. that concept. Jeff Smith and I are kindred spirits precisely for that particular concept. And actually, Jeff enters into this discussion a little bit today. So um, the title of this being, uh, you, you know, you can still teach a, an experienced dog uh, new tricks. I found that out uh, to a great degree this uh, past summer, uh, which was really, really an excellent one for me. It's um, I've been involved with the Colts Drum and Bugle Corps uh, since, off and on since uh, 2004 in this year. I was a, a particularly great one for the for the drum corps, but it was also a particularly great one for me uh, in terms of continuing this lifelong learning uh, situation. Um, I was going into the season, I was giving a, given a challenging uh, project and that was to be working with the mellophones and they were being expanded from 12 to 16. Now, any of you who have been high school band directors know to get two or three mellophones to play in tune with a great quality of sound is a task. I mean, mm-hmm. that is like an entire year's worth of work. And it was a particularly challenging thing within the cult show because the first major musical statement of the entire show was um, eight measures at a slow tempo with choreography of a unison uh, mellophone statement. So that was a a pretty significant challenge to uh, to be in, encountering. And I thought a lot about it over the course of the winter. And I was looking for my traditional bag of tricks that we do to fix the scenario that I that I mentioned. So it would it would be singing, and it would be whistling, and it would be mouthpiece buzzing, and it would be the John Cooper uh, numbers. And uh, so all of that was all in the, my bag of tricks. Uh, but I'm, something in the back of my mind said we need to do something a little bit different. And as it happened, I was having a conversation online uh, with, with Jeff Smith, mentioning this whole bag of tricks and stuff. And he just said, it was very sage, uh, and he just said, we continue to grow. And that said to me, I've got to find something else. So in thinking of the process, it's like, okay, one thing that I haven't explored here is soulfish. And um, because this is a musical statement that needed to be right right off the bat. Mm-hmm. It was the credibility of the brass ensemble from show one. It was not going to be finely tuned at that particular point in time, but it had to work. It had to be credible and it was ridiculously exposed. So when I came with this uh, idea of the uh, solfege, it was sort of in a sense from left field because at UMass, they didn't teach a solfege. And uh, in my teaching, I had taught myself it kind of in one year with the uh, repertory jazz band at Cape, uh, we had had an Ellington tune, which was a little bit gnarly harmonically. And I said, well, we have to do something with this. And, and we, we did solfege that, but that's the only time really in my teaching career that, that I utilized um, solfege. And one of the, the issues with the particular uh, 
that initial statement of the show is that um, there's an 80 day thing from the beginning of spring training to the end of uh, DCI finals. So that's 80 days of those students living with that music. You could not practice that melody 80 days in a row. It mm-hmm. just very simply would have taken all the life and, and the life would have left it and the students would have been just pretty disengaged. Yeah. So I, I just figured that there's what I had to do is look at it in a, a creative way. I said to them from the get go, we're never going to rehearse this melody. We won't. And they're kind of giving me a, you know, a, a look like a sort of what, what's up. So what I did is I taught them the solfege and I taught them the tune in solfege. And one of the things that happened was really, really interesting for you talk about learning. So I taught them, you know, do, re, mi, whatever. And then I'm hearing from, um, I'm hearing from uh, two of the students, uh, do, re. So I just like stopped, like, what's that all about? And they explained, well, of course, that's what you do because they were singers and they knew the proper thing. And that just sort of said, okay, I've just learned something here. So we learned it in, in the uh, correct fashion. And one of the students involved uh, was uh, uh, Matthew. And uh, Matthew is, is, is brilliant, first of all, uh, just a really, really lovely human being, but a great musician. And uh, he has aspirations to be, at some point in time, uh, a, a music teacher. So after a few days of doing uh, the, the solfege uh, on the tune, I, you know, I, I just said to him, first of all, you have a really, really lovely voice. Sing them how this ought to be, but in a solfege situation with the kind of inflections and everything that you would do if you were a singer. And he did that for a little bit. And then a few days later, I said to him, well, now take them through this. And so he, he did. And he, he said to me afterwards, he said, I was terrified. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, uh, Matthew, we all are in the beginning. So that was like a cool little sidelight that I really hadn't expected in the beginning of this. So what we did is we rehearsed. Well, can I stop for a second? Sure. So you get to a point. So you, you're known for sort of like taking a lot of people under your wing and mentoring them and giving them positions and, you know, ways to improve and get, learn how to be a teacher even before they're teachers and, yep. and growing all these people. So I thank you for that. Yep. Um, so you're always looking for that opportunity. And I think that's really important that we all do that. Um, also, I want to go back real quick. You mentioned whistling. Yep. And I know that's not the point of what we we're doing. But I think a lot of people listening, they hear singing or humming or buzzing. Like I think they know about the benefits of doing all that. Mm-hmm. And you and I have talked about whistling a lot especially as a brass player. But I think there's a lot of people who don't know about those benefits. So can you talk about that real quickly? Yeah, there are two benefits uh, to whistling. First of all, is, is, is the aural uh, a concept and really hearing uh, intervals in a way that you can't really rely upon anything except your ear. And it's a really, really a, a pure form. When you think about it, even if you're mm-hmm. doing a soulfish thing, you're thinking uh, another syllable, but in this, you're just, you know, uh, dealing with the sound as if you were, you were singing, but it's just another way of doing it. And of course for brass players, if, if we happen to have an ascending interval, uh, the the action of the tongue in that situation rising as the as the pitch rises gives us the the right physical thing mm-hmm. uh, that we can really uh, incorporate like without even thinking kind of thing it just makes it be a more natural uh, so what you're taking you're taking if a kid can whistle yep you're taking what they can do and saying you're doing this on the mellophone or this on any brass instrument yeah and for those kids who can't whistle well you're out of luck well, but this, from an oral sense, there's plenty around you. So that's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the uh, one aspect of But it. I remember learning that, the, you know, we talk about like, oh, ah, e, things yep. like that. But yep. when you whistle, you do exactly the same thing. Yes. Yes. And, and when you're looking for like a wide intervallic skip, if you're conscious of like what is going on with the tongue, um, it, it's a little bit of a less of a natural, less natural kind of mm-hmm. thing. In this situation, it's purely natural, and so what you're doing is you're you're getting that skill, but without making it be in the forefront. Because a lot of times, the the less you think about certain aspects from a technical viewpoint, the better off you are. As you know, as, as mm-hmm. a brass player in particular, it's easy easy to overthink it. And the whole act of whistling is just such a natural thing that it's just like, okay, and you're dealing with. Uh, two issues at once, the oral one and the physical one, you know, and I, you know, we're both, we're both brass players. I think, 
a lot of times people talk about how to get higher on a brass instrument, or they talk about how to do something different on a brass instrument. And sometimes it's correct. And sometimes it's misguided. Like I think fast air is important on an, on an instrument, you know, however, I, I've hung with Trent Austin and he's like, look, I'm going to play a double D without using any air. Right. So <laughs> like, I'm not saying I know it all, but you know, using really fast air for me, my, my, my flag is hanging in the front of the room my American flag, right? Yep, yep. So I'll have kids like blow their airstream and try to move that flag. Yep. Or I'll put like a small spot on the board and I'll say, aim a really skinny piece of air at this. You know, a lot of people use straws too, right? We talk about like fast air moving, especially as yep. we go higher. Um, I think a lot of people talk about embouchure too and like tightening of your embouchure. And I, I, that's not something I subscribe to. To me, it's all about, you have to have tight corners, but the middle has to buzz freely. That's correct. Think about in terms of, Firm corners, not even tight corners necessarily. Firm corners, which is getting to the same thing, the center needs to, to be pro, uh, pliable because that's your read, and you you stop having range when the vibrations of the lip stop. One thing that does work like a charm is that the the, the water hose thing, which I'm, I'm you may or may not have heard of out there. But uh, so you, you, you have a water hose and you're hanging out with your, your brother or sister and you know, they're annoying you. And so you have the water hose on kind of thing. And it, it's not getting to them. They just sort of like, you know, walking away, whatever, you very simply take your thumb and put it in in the uh, the water, uh, the stream of water, and all of a sudden, it goes faster and it gets them. That's like a, a, a concept of playing higher, which I think is uh, works because it keeps things relatively relaxed and what it does is you think about this if you're putting your thumb into the airstream actually it's like putting your tongue a little bit higher in the mm -hmm. mouth kind of thing yep and with respect to to the range aspect of things the the uh a lot of the similar concepts are in the maggio book and that's something that, that i use in my own playing all the time i'm looking to expand my range uh the the tongue level thing is like really really important the overall scheme of things and it really does come down to the speed of air i think as a young teacher i used to think very wrongly that it was about volume of air amounts of air tank up well yes mm -hmm. you have to tank up but it's got to be the right kind of air and it's got to be channeled in the correct way you can i also think of sometimes i have them like aim their air high in the mouthpiece and aim their air low in the mouthpiece yep you know all those different things can help. And I guess if people are not brass players, because you and I have like physical advice because we do this, yep. right? But for those who are not brass players, seek out those brass players that are near you mm -hmm. and learn as many tr tricks and tips as you can. Absolutely, particularly as it pertains to uh, expanding range. That's one of the things that really tends to be a problem. And if it's taught incorrectly, uh, it's, it's one of those, uh, it's really hard to undo what's been and, done. And with range, like you need muscles in your face. You do. Right. You, you have to yep. be have strong embouchures. Yep. And unfortunately, over the last number of years, kids embouchures have gotten weaker and weaker because there's so many other things for them to do. Yep. So they there's less lead trumpet players right now. There's less lead trombone players. Kids are not as strong. So it's important in your fundamental block warm up that you're doing long tones, lip slurs, all the things that are really important to build muscle. The fundamentals are really, really important, uh, doubly important now than they were pre pandemic, because we're really going from a, a more basic uh, level of development than we were before, but it presents it presents a great opportunity. You, you mentioned the uh, range aspect of, of things. Uh, last year, I judged uh, the um, for uh, all state jazz, the, the trumpet auditions. And I was amazed. I mean, there were, so there were some decent uh, jazz trumpet players in, in Maine last year that ended up in the Allstate uh, Festival. Uh, but the I didn't really hear very much in terms of like, like say a great high C. We did all of these interview into uh, yes, all of these uh, auditions, and uh, there was some good jazz playing, good feel, good solos, good sounds, and all that kind of stuff. But even with the players who ended up playing lead in the two jazz ensembles, it was like I haven't like mm -hmm. really heard a great high C, and we didn't hear anything above a great high yep. C. Now, when they got into the context, they had the tools 
some of them, but they really like really didn't uh, like have them just like so locked in. It's like all of a sudden at any point in time, they could pop a G or a C or, uh, or whatever. If they had to work towards it. And of course you can see that uh, and uh, the development over the course of a few days, it's like, okay, you, you don't get that immediately. Mm -hmm. Some of it is, is related to the factors that you talk to, uh, but that some of it is also related to the, the, the kind of literature that's being uh, performed at this point in time. I don't know whether it's cause and effect or effect and cause, but for example, there are uh, bands do not play uh, Buddy Rich anymore. Bands do not play um, Stan Kenton anymore. Uh, some of the, the people really stretch the, the Tessa Torres. And uh, I don't know if it's just because we don't have that sort of player available or it's changing taste. I think it's a combination of two, mm -hmm. particularly uh, when I judge down in Massachusetts, it's, this is all about, uh, the, those bands are all about Ellington. And with the exception of Cat Anderson, and no one has a Cat Anderson, right. but the Tessa Torres in, those, in the Ellington charts are actually, uh, for uh, brass players, uh, pretty modest. Mm -hmm. And so th they don't have to have that set of skills. If you're playing Amanda Ferguson chart or Buddy chart or a Kenton chart, you have to have a certain, I mean, you, you have to have a horse mm -hmm. who has like, like a solid G. And then, though, you have to have a second player who has something equally strong. It's not, you know, just like one right. great lead player and you can like fill in the middle. It, does, it doesn't work that way. So it's an interesting cause and effect thing that I've thought a lot about recently mm -hmm. as uh, programming, uh, things have changed so much. Yeah, it's, it's definitely hard. You know, you wouldn't be smart to program buddy rich if you can't play, if your kids can't play up there. Yep. Right. Um, so you're either, you're right. I don't know what comes first. I definitely noticed a difference in the average brass player about 10 or 15 years ago, kind of changed, you know, they just, I don't know if it's, they spend more time, less, less time on the horn. Um, but anyway, I think everybody kind of probably recognizes this. If you have those players do it, but if you don't, if you don't, don't, but at the same time, you need to stretch them that, you know, like what's, I know we're, we're like kind of everywhere now, but like, so you have a program and you have a kid who has a constant high C. Do you program something with D's? Because I mean, I learned how to play high because I was said, I was told you need to play high. I said, yep. okay, I'll play high. So I don't know if that were like, and if you go out as a judge and you're hearing a band and this kid is squeaking out a D or an E, like, is it worth doing that? I think it's important to ask kids to play higher, but it, you have to balance that too with what's going to sound good. As a judge, my first inclination is to say to myself, at least, this tessitura is, is, is too high in an evaluated situation. You want to present your kids to, to the best possible. So if, if they're, they top out at a C, that's great. If occasionally you want to have a situation where they creep a little bit above it in a certain context, it's like that's perfectly fine. And you probably have to because you do – end up limiting that kid to that's like what he he can do and uh, or she can do but uh again it comes down to the like the the basics of how how you approach that kind of thing how you approach the building of uh of uh, uh brass uh players in terms of range and all and all that kind of stuff the thing that i found recently in my own playing and then in the work that i did with these students this uh, summer is the single best f for me at this point a uh, tool to uh, build uh, tessitura in in uh, brass players, uh, the Chickowitz flow studies. Mm -hmm. And so I do those every single day. And um, I find that I can work on my range without hurting myself. I work on my sound at the exact same time. And so I've gotten myself to the time uh, to the point where I, every single day I have a, a, a solid D and uh, uh, most often an, an E. Now, not that I'm going to go, you know, be playing some of these big band charts, but it, it's it's expanding it without hurting myself mm -hmm. at all. It's a very, very uh, benign way. And you work on your sound at the same point in time. It's pretty and, cool. And for anybody who can't find those or doesn't have them, reach out to me and I'm happy to put you in touch with those. All right, let's get back to Solfege. I know we, we digressed <laughs> from that, but. Well, in, in the one other aspect, we did digress, didn't we? <laughs> That's okay. Oh, that, that, it's, I haven't seen you in a long time, so we have a lot to digress <laughs> about. So, uh, the um, we ended up rehearsing this opening sequence of, of the show in in snips and the first like really really tricky interval was the, it was this this uh do la b flat to to g so that was the the big interval and that's the one that the judges are apt to pick on and that's the one that's a little bit tricky and so we spent a pretty good amount of time on that and we did like that off and on throughout the entire summer and we finally got it like about the last 
week, week and a half, so that we weren't getting called out in any way for any kind of a different tone quality or intonation kind of thing on that intervallic skip. But the other way that I that I did it was to deal with other parts of that melodic line. So it, it happened to be there was one spot, it, it went me, re. And so we would we would work that just those two notes, getting to sing them, getting to, to play them. And then we and then a re, do was a big one because they had like this, this 16 count unison B flat. There was a, as, as exposed it could be. If there's any blemish there, someone is, is, going, mm-hmm. is going to bag on it. So what we found over the course of the summer was that they very seldom got called out for intonation stuff, which I was very proud of. Way to go. That one interval w- was, was the thing that, you know, if anyone would say anything, it would be in that situation. But the work on that was really something that, that, that uh, helped elsewhere. Uh, we had, uh, they had a big melodic statement in the uh, Matheny Minuano. And so the, the, the big melodic thing, do, re, mi, and then the second phrase, do, re, me, and that's how we did it. I taught him solfege on that. We didn't work the notes, but very, very little. We worked that uh, uh, interval skip, and they never, ever, ever, ever got any kind of grief about intonation on those those long sustained notes at that point in time. I, I, I was proud of that. There was one other aspect of the of the uh, the ear uh, uh, training thing that went on, and. Uh, if you know any of the history of of uh, the Kenton band, you know that he had at one point in time four mellophones in the early 60s. It was really uh, tricky getting the intonation right. Uh, also, it was um, when the mellophone players joined the band, they were always bummed out because they didn't make the trumpet section. So they mm-hmm. were sort of like the, you know, the... the, the castaways. The, yes, the castaways. Yeah. And uh, so, but... Uh, the, some of the stuff they recorded was great. And there's a great album called um, Sophisticated Approach that Lenny Niehaus wrote for them. And the mellophone writing on that is absolutely superb. So at one point I said, I want them to know exactly what this me- what this instrument should sound like. I couldn't say to them, really, you need to sound like the French horn section of the Chicago Symphony, because that's what we would usually say to them, except that's not the same instrument. Right. So I said, I'm, uh, let's... I, I, I see what we're going to unleash here. So I brought in some um, some Kenton and a really superb. Uh, you got to you got to check out this album. Superb uh, recording of uh, a knee house chart on how long has this been going on. Beautiful, beautiful piece of music. And so what I said to him is, when they get to the shout chorus, this is what the mellophone should sound like in 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 like its big moments. And it's, it's so gorgeous, it's ridiculous. The mellophones are like soaring over the screeching trumpets. I mean, it's, just, it's, 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 it's beautiful. And uh, so um, these kids are like so smart because I said that to them. It's like, this is what you should sound like there. We went to the uh, ensemble rehearsal afterwards. I never had to talk to them about what their presence at the big moments would be. They never overdid it in terms of tone quality or anything else. It, it was just, there was a good, strong presence and all the box had to do is tweak what they w- w- were giving, but they had that ingrained in the brain right off the bat. The other cool thing is one of the, the Soulfish uh, twins, as I call them, uh, Ethan is uh, an audiophile to the nth degree. We share stuff all the time still. And, but one, he came up with this uh, thing uh, called um, uh, Melophonium uh, Motifs, and it was a blog about the about the Kenton band, and he posted it, and it was so cool. There was stuff that I didn't know. Hmm. It's like, and I thought I knew that band, and so that turned out to be a you know a really really important part of what that experience was uh, this summer w- with that group of kids, and and I will say before we leave this subject that we can continue to have situations that change our lives as teachers, even at this stage in the game for me, that, and I had the benefit of like having so many great, great students down through the years, the Bitterford kids, the Cape kids, uh, this kid for kid may have been uh, the best group of kids that I've ever worked with in my entire uh, time teaching. It was, it was so inspirational. They were just sweet kids, good musicians, and they were like sponges. And uh, 
So that to me was really inspirational. That got me every single day to be like really, really motivated. I mean, mm -hmm. during spring training, I, w I would be, I, I found this little place, this little nature uh, place in this campus in uh, uh, Illinois where we were and like trees and stuff like that. And they would be, you know, just like squirrels and there was there was there were uh you know, fawns and all this kind of stuff like in this nature preserve and i'm sitting there every single day doing my warm-up soul fishing my um chicken witch studies while i'm doing them and just like getting really really inspired to work with these kids and i said to them it's like the hour that we spend in sectional is the the very best time of my entire day and i really really believe that and they were so consistent in their work so uh, kudos to them for just being great human beings so the the second uh trick involves a a, a trumpet feature um i had uh for a few days i was uh, switched to the uh to the trumpets and there was a great uh, uh judge uh, by the name of nola jones who we knew was going to be a player in Indianapolis. And she said to us uh, about in the ballad with this trumpet feature, it's like, it's got to be operatic. Well, it was a pop tune that I wasn't quite sure had lyrics, uh, but I know what she was aiming towards. And I couldn't say to them, and here's a, a, a bit in how my uh, teaching has been changing. I couldn't say to them, you need to play more expressively. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. But you can't, you can't stage manage every second of it either. So it's got to be something that gets internalized. So at this point in time, I said, we have a dilemma here, but we have an opportunity. And so I channeled my inner Michelle Fernandez. <laughs> and uh, so the nature of the piece was uh, that uh, you're phoning home or you're phoning a friend and the person, so the, the production started kind of thing, ringtone, and there's no one on the other end of the line. And so you leave a message uh, along the lines of, I really missed you and all that kind of stuff. And so that was the narrative of the show. So I said, well, we need something that's going to get them to internalize that. So what I did is um, I very simply wrote a lyric and uh, that fit the narrative and pretty much fit, fit the melodic line. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and taught it to them. We talked about it a little bit. And um, certainly no one is going to forget uh, Sondheim <laughs> with these lyrics. Sure. But I mean, it, it served the purpose. And it got them on their way so that when the regular trumpet uh, tech, uh, Justin Diaz, came in later on, he was able to fine tune all that stuff. But I was really, really pleased uh, that that it was that was the beginnings of that process for them, but it also taught me, it's like this does work because I've been thinking about that technique that uh, Michelle talked about in an earlier podcast. And I've sort of taught that way, but not with that sort of uh, specificity and that real real vividness. Mm -hmm. And to be able to, to, to share with a lyric to them, I mean, this is a friend you haven't seen in a long time. You really wanted to have contact again, and you're, you're missing again. I miss you so much kind of thing. And uh, I think that that really helped their uh, expressiveness, made it really come alive for well, them. Yeah, and what you did when you did that is you made it personal for them. You oh. made it intimate. You made it interactive. You made yes. you brought them right into it because yep. you know yep. all the kids, no matter how young band students you teach, they all have life experiences. Yep. And obviously, you can't do stuff like this when they're the younger they are. You need some certain maturity to do certain things. But the fact that you're able to take something that wasn't quite connecting and finding a way to make it personal sure. to them, that's that's where it's at. And well, and, and think about this particular show was a was a fantastic one to to work on. So it was, it was in essence about home kind of thing. And uh, it was it was so uh, meaningful for the kids because they're experiencing all of this. Think about this, and a, a large part of the drum corps had never ever marched in drum corps before. A lot of these kids had never ever been away from home before. Mm -hmm. And they're gone for 80 days. If they're lucky, they see a, uh, a family member on one of the stops and tour, but most of them don't kind of thing. So they're feeling that sort of thing. And one of the beautiful things, they did a voiceover just before classical gas in this show. And the voiceover was uh, along the lines of the, the, the bus, the buses are leaving the parking lot after you've had an interaction with your family. And it's like, bye bye, I'll see you later kind of thing. And it was like, whew. 
and, and everyone involved, all of us, because we've all felt that as, mm -hmm. you know, being on the road, that really, really that longing for family. And that was poignant. And it was it was it was a poignant moment that the, I think the audience really related to. And that was in, in the design of the show. But some of this stuff happened too as, hey, this can lead to this. And the voiceover thing was a, a late addition that I that I thought was really, really brilliant, made the whole thing come alive. That's great. You know, I I don't know if I'm just having a squirrel moment or whatever, but you're talking about home and I think about one of the one of the first things in my life of a of a production that taught me about home. And of course that's the Wizard of Oz. Absolutely. Because like the, the the center thing around that is like there's no place like home, right? It's all it took me forever to realize the whole thing was a dream. Like I don't know why it took me so so long to figure <laughs> that out, but the fact that that whole like there's no place from home and Ben Zander says in one of his talks like you know you get in and you you get in and you finally sit down in your chair and you just have that breath you know that i'm home you know again such a, a great way to bring musical experience to these kids in a way that they understand oh it, it, it's it was connected to life in a way that really no other production um that i've been connected with really uh, had that sort of like visceral visceral pull uh, this is was not the first time by the way that the, the uh, colts had done a show about home uh, they they had done one like in 05 when I first got there, but it, it was a, a different kind of thing. It was more at an arm's distance, but this was like very, very visceral. Visceral, you could wrap your arms around it. So Super cool. Yeah. So um, third trick. Uh, third trick is uh, the book. And uh, for those of you who are out there, uh, it's called The Art of Connecting. It's called by Claire Rains and Laura Ewing. It is fabulous. Um, I'll get to it in a second. Central uh, to my uh, teaching approach uh, is, is connecting. I think the most exciting, it's the most challenging, but exciting aspect of, of being a, a music educator is that kind of connection with other human beings. Sure. The more I do it, the more fascinated I, 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 I get by it. I think it's critical. And that's so, why kids are in band too. Well, so they yes. can connect with other people. Yes. Yeah. And again, that's Michelle Fernandez 101. So much of this stuff, stuff is, but uh, that, that whole connection, I think, is, is really, really critical because if you have the human connection right, um, the music really does take care of itself. Assuming you have the right material in front of them, that's the, the easy part. Uh, but the really rewarding, challenging, and fun part is the whole uh, human connection thing. The best piece of advice I ever got on teaching was from my college trumpet teacher, Walter Chestnut. And uh, he said to me one time, he said, Tom, there is a child behind every instrument. Mm -hmm. And I have, as a teacher, tried to live my teaching life in in that way and it is just so so true so going into the season i did a a, a pre uh a survey with the uh, mellophone kids and it was like along the lines of like uh so tell us something about yourself and what's your favorite music and what's your favorite sport and what's your favorite food and so reading all those because you get a tremendous insight into kids so aiden lives in chicago Aiden loves Jacob Collier. That's two points of connection with, with, with the two of us. Uh, Jillian uh, loves seafood of any sort, food in particular, but seafood, there's a connection. Hannah is a cello player who listens to Christmas music 24-7. Another connection. <laughs> um, uh, Nick. You're a cello player? Uh, uh, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 I like them. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, and uh, uh, Nick is a, a is a baseball player and he's like fanatical about baseball. So that's a whole summer full of conversations you yep. know, with, with with Nick back and forth. So that's the thing that I tried to get into is that was so the way I went into spring training, I really had a good grasp of uh, I thought of these kids and then that was a springboard to another connection. I, uh, one of the uh, the uh, uh, mellophone players uh, is an artist and her grandmother is an artist and my mother's an artist so we were you know like she's showing me her grandmother's uh, uh, paintings which is sort of like combination of of uh, Rockwell and Salvatore Dali it was kind of interesting then I showed her uh, some stuff that my mother has done so that particular uh, connection uh, was there. And that stuff is really, really important. It just gives you those little sidelights when you're walking 
from rehearsal to rehearsal to have a conversation. This kid, Ethan, I was telling you about that. He's a jazz guitar player. And we talked uh, like jazz stuff all all summer long, not in rehearsals. I didn't make it like a be real big deal. Mm. It wasn't a, a soliloquy of any sort. Um, but that sort of thing, like really provides a, a, a bond. So in this case, with the book, serendipity enters into it. I'm uh, between uh, move ins, and then I was home for like three weeks. And then I went back on the road. And so I was staying at my mother's house. And I was walking by, I was doing a walk, I was walking by this, you've seen those things where it's it's like, take a book, give a book, those little houses. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those, those are great. Yeah. I, I, I frequent them. And uh, so anyway, I happened to be walking by in the book, The Art of Connecting, uh, happened to be one in there. So I scooped that up and um, really just started to dig into it. And there's some very interesting aspects of this. Uh, the, the premise of the book is sometimes you're in a situation where you cannot, you're in front of people that you really don't know. You don't have six months to learn them. You just, you have to, you're making a presentation, for example, and you have to, within three minutes, make a connection, somehow make a connection. And in our life, check this out. You're doing a district band. You're doing an all-state band. You're guest conducting yep. somewhere. Yep. In a short order, you have got to make a connection. So I found that ter terrifically interesting. And uh, so sometimes, according to what the book says, and it's right, it's as simple as where you're from. So, excuse me, I ran into a, the, one of the bus drivers was, I, I was observing, and that's the other thing, you have to be very, very observant. So I was observing this bus driver. He was always off on his own somewhat not antisocial, but just sort of in his own bubble. And so I walked out to him one day and I said, you know me, you know my name, because you've been calling me that, but I don't know yours. Who are you? You know, like, what's your name and where you're from? Well, it turns out the guy was a, um, a teacher, uh, a science teacher of seventh and eighth graders at an American school in Spain for seven or eight years. That's his story. I never got to like, how do you end up a, as a bus driver? But he had fascinating things. And this is a guy who could speak very, very intelligently on the environment, on politics and everything else, just by me saying, hey, what's your name and where, where are you mm -hmm. from kind of thing. So that interest in, in, in other people, I think, is, is something that's really, really critical in the overall scheme of things. And it's important for us. What happens if you have, say you haven't had much contact with the middle school and all of a sudden you have a class of freshmen coming in? How do you initiate that whole process of getting them to feel part of the group? And how do you get to know them fast so that there is a hook there somehow? Uh, because as you say, I mean, the social aspect of band is, is, is really, really critical. Uh, think of the uh, kids in band that, that, that have been, uh, they like playing, but they're not band kids in the strictest yep. sense. But the kid comes in with a Patriot shirt. Bam. Discussion. That might be the hook that keeps uh, that particular kid mm -hmm. in band. So the human connection thing is is, is really critical. So in, in, in that, we're talking about the, co the connection. You know, I've been noticing doing all these interviews with people and learning from all these people that like the tenants of I was I was asked back in May by Music Ed Insights. Um, they said, what are some common themes you see through all these things? And one was programming a great repertoire. Yep. One was striving for mastery, making sure you're excelling for excellence. And we're talking about like developing technique and skills and kids. That's kind of under that bubble. But, but the third one was connection. The third one was relationship with students. So all of this is in my view, like one of these three huge tenants in, in being a, a successful music teacher, you know, and, mm -hmm. and Tyler, Tyler Ehrlich, I was talking to, he's a, he's a doctoral student in um, mm -hmm. university of Texas, Austin. And, he wrote in Matthew Arau's book Upbeat about how to connect with how to connect with students who don't seem to care, mm -hmm. who don't seem to want to try, and it's all about get to know them, connect them, you know, make a have a relationship with them. That's what's going to make them want to try. You know, you're right. You're not going to have any kind of behavior issues if you have a classroom full of kids who are connected to you and care. Yep. I mean, it, this is really the center of of everything we do. Well, in, in, in part of this book uh, really gets into that whole thing of like meeting them where they are, 
not where we are. Mm -hmm. Where we are is that's a whole other thing. If you meet them where they are and you look at the world through their eyes and you see their their hopes and aspirations, because every kid in front of you, even if they're they're not very much together, has hopes and aspirations. And if you can get into that, then you they really get the sense that the person in front of me like truly cares about me because that's their world. Like my world is all about me kind of and thing. And how do you, and I think the master teachers are able to meet them where they're at, but also grow them as musicians and as people. Because it's really easy to say, well, no, I want you to learn, so I want to bring you up to where I am. You have to meet them, but with the goal of bringing them to where you want them to be. If, if you get them to be receptive because they realize that they're respected, yep. then they're going to be much more receptive to that. And they're going to be very influenced by you. It's like, okay, that person is like pretty hip, you know, or they understand me. They get me. You know, think about this. How, like how many situations you've ever been in your life? We all have in which you're dealing with someone, whether it's a superior or a colleague or whatever, that very simply doesn't get you. That's really, really a frustrating thing. And if you're sitting is in a large group and stuff like that, it's like, okay, the person in front of me doesn't really care about me and doesn't get me, mm-hmm. then that has a profound influence on, on what the learning is going to be. I love it. Absolutely. It's great. So, you know, one of the aspects of this book, by the way, which is really cool, and it's, it's, it's paid dividends so far. We think about human relations, and it's us. It's a, it's a two-way chess game. It's us, and it's the other person involved. And then we try to have empathy for that other person and hopefully figure out so we can get all of this relationship to work. The book looks at it as a three-part chess game, and this is brilliant. There is you and your viewpoint. There's the other person and their viewpoint. And you look at this situation as an uninterested or interested third party. So you've pulled uh, like apart a from this and you look at what you are and what you're saying, and what your reactions are. And you look at that other person and all that and how they're reacting to what you're giving. And all of a sudden you can, in this situation, look at it and say, here's what I've got to do to make this tricky situation work. There's a new perspective there. Mm-hmm. And in a couple of situations, I've had a couple of tricky ones uh, to, to deal with. And I've used this technique and it's like, you know, that really, really does work. And, and, and I'm thinking one particular situation that is, that is it was like kind of like a, a long term thing it was just it was not a terrifically negative thing, but something that was not quite working out as far as like a connection and stuff like that. And I used this technique and I really listened to what the other person had been saying about stuff that had happened in their own life. And all of a sudden, bingo, now this makes sense. It's not my viewpoint and that person's viewpoint. It's how that person's outlook and and actions are affected by what had happened in the past kind of thing. I can be a lot more dispassionate about it and I can be a lot more uh, magnanimous about it. And all of a sudden, a situation that was tricky all of a sudden had great, great clarity to it. So, uh, and, and, and so in that you're making it, you're saying, this is not about me. I'm, I'm part of this, but like, it's not about me. And for me, I don't know if anybody else relates to this, but for me, that keeps my stress level down. Oh, I'm no longer rising and lowering with the tide of every tantrum of every 13 or 14 year old. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm like kind of, you know, you can treat it as a sort of detachable, thing yep that it's also the same thing like the band sounds bad my heart rate goes up like (laughs) no how can you stay less stressed and i think this is a key to that i think i think looking and understanding it's not about you you're simply there to serve to help these kids go and another thing like in the john wooden side of things look forward 30 years and see what you're helping develop in this person like they're not gonna if they play trumpet fine but you're developing a future teacher you're developing a future priest you're developing a future architect you're developing you know all these things and again that comes with wisdom and comes with time. Oh, oh, it, it, it really does. And it, it, it's that whole idea of uh, it, it, how important is, is this particular situation? I, I, I'll give you a, a, a quick example of that. And uh, I just spent uh, a bunch of time uh, in uh, New York this past week. And uh, I was uh, at, at this uh, restaurant and I had a great breakfast 
pricey, but it was a great breakfast. Uh, and uh, so then the next day I go back to the same place. And uh, what happened is they were a little bit short staffed. And I realized that going in because all of a sudden the maitre d's, the person took my order. It's like, okay. Uh, but I didn't really think about it. And all of a sudden the table next to me, four people, they come in, they get their meal, they go. The guy next to me comes in like 15, 20 minutes later. He gets his meal, he's come and gone. I haven't gotten my meal yet. And so the maitre d' rushes over and said, oh, we're going to copy your, your juice and your coffee. And I'm like, okay, that's good. And he's, it'll be out in about four minutes. And so like 20 minutes later is like when, when it came. It, it flicked for a quick second, uh, you know, like the, the red light, just, uh, you know, should I just very simply exit the scene? Mm -hmm. And I just like said, uh, no, I'm just going to very simply sit for a few more minutes. The food came. It was great. So rather than being like bent out of shape, it was like I, I made that particular. This was not important in the overall scheme of things. It, it was a little bit late. It's no one's fault in particular. They feel bad about it. Why should I be difficult? Why should I get myself worked up about that? I was able to sit and as if like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. I had my meal and stuff like that. So that way of, of doing things, what is important? Did you have a conversation with the maitre d' afterward? No. See, it was funny. So like my wife and kids and I were at a, a local restaurant and that happened to us too. It was literally like two hours and we haven't eaten, you haven't eaten yet. Kids are freaking out. My, <laughs> my wife and I are starving, but it's one of these like, this is a bigger lesson kind of thing. <laughs> Turns out our server was a former student of ours and the restaurant was completely dysfunctional. And, it, and she was like freaking out, trying to do everything. Cause like, here's my two band teachers. She had, <laughs> she had my middle school teacher and my high school teacher. And like, they're both here and I'm no and pressure. I, no, no pressure. And at the end, we were just, we were able to kind of love on her and say, look, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're better than this restaurant. Like all these issues are not your problems. Have you looked at this other restaurant? Have you looked at this restaurant? You're doing a great job. You need to do that. Of course, you know, that, that sort of led her to feeling more positive and realizing it wasn't her fault too. Yep. So, and, and, and it's like anything, if you can make people feel better about themselves, uh, that to me is, is one of my, my major missions in life these days. I mean, like when I go onto the turnpike, I always have a brief conversation with the toll takers. And, and when I go into restaurants, I try to be particularly nice because I realize what else they're getting. And there's more to life. If you can make someone else's life, you can make them feel good about themselves kind of thing. You're improving society, which is in the final analysis is what the aim of teachers ought to be. Mm -hmm. So I do have one more thing, and then I get there were some questions. Oh, we got a lot of uh, a lot of people asking some questions, things we can hit. So we're gonna hit those too. Okay. So my my last thing is um, rock and roll McDonald's. <laughs> so um, okay, <laughs> uh, we're headed to. Well, I'm on the brass bus. We're headed uh, on the bus. It's a jam pack bus uh, uh, to the uh, to the from the warm up to the uh, final site at uh, Lucas Oil Stadium, which is one of the great thrills that one could have as a teacher to have a group in the venue of that sort. And so the brass bus is rocking. I mean, like literally kind of thing with all their various tunes that they have. We had a very hip bus driver, which is cool, but uh, all of these tunes and stuff like that. And so one of the tunes that comes on is Rock and Roll McDonald's. I don't know. <laughs> and so anyway, these kids, I mean, they're hooting and hollering and, and, and screaming and ready to go. And uh, I hear quietly in the seat right next to me, one, four, five, <laughs> one. There's a kid, Alessi, uh, the, the uh, trumpet section leader, is there doing a harmonic analysis while these guys are out of their mind about this upcoming show. And that just said to me what a, uh, what a special group this was, but a special group that music students are. Here's my, my thought on that. Uh, the best students in the school are music students. Uh, maybe the best of the best turns out to be the ones who also decide to do marching band because of the physical aspect of things. And But the very best of the best of the best from all of my teaching experience are drum corps kids. And that sort of thing when a kid is doing a harmonic analysis and when they're going like and it's the two things at once uh, the, the the counterpoint was just like striking and uh it was just uh it was a, a great way to capture and uh, uh capsulize uh, what was a really really great uh summer with this group of individuals and band camp uh band kids are all the same everywhere you go i've i've told that i've been told that many times I, 
I think that that's true. And, yeah. and you know, what's interesting is uh, one of the things in my retirement that I've done uh, and will continue to do is a, a lot of uh, residencies at schools, whether it's to do a rehearsal or to do an entire day. I've done a lot of that down in Massachusetts in, in particular. My experience has been uniformly excellent. And it's not that I'm any mm -hmm. wizard at this. These are really, really good kids. And in part of programs where teachers really, really care, but they're the best of the best. There's no doubt about it. If there's anybody listening who wants to reach out and connect with DL, feel free to uh, email me, uh, check in with me, and I'll give you his information. Also, he would love to come to your school and hang out with you, I'm sure, right, T? I think that that would be, uh, that's one of my missions in life. Especially if they feed you. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and which, which brings me to one more point. Um, and that is... You have uh, to feed the band. Is that uh, the, the yeah. point? You have to feed the band. <laughs> One of the things that they never uh, tell you, I've t I said this to Kyle in the past and, and everyone that I talked to actually, uh, one of the things they don't tell you, no one tells you that as soon as it's, uh, you know, like you've really gotten pretty good at this stuff, it's the time when it's not to do it anymore. And I remember that in the latter part of my teaching uh, career last couple of weeks and stuff like that. I'm thinking, you know, I've worked my entire life to have the kind of classroom management that I have dreamed about, you know, and this and that aspect of it. And then I'm like, it, yeah, but I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> it took me that long. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason that I love working with schools in these residencies, because now I can take all that and continue to, to use it kind of thing. But it is a lifelong pursuit. But then it's a lifelong pursuit, even after you don't do it anymore is a lifelong pursuit, if, you, if that makes any kind of sense. So I've said this before, but you and Tom Brady have something else in common, besides a love of sports. Um, he, he said the same thing in the last five or six years of his career. He's like, I know the game now. I figured it out. Yep. Why am I going to stop now? Yep. And, and you know what it made me do is it really made me deeply appreciate what I had as a teacher, particularly in, te in teaching in such a fabulous place as is, uh, Cape Elizabeth and having Jeff Shedd as a principal and all of the, the individuals involved working with Caitlin and then t before that, Terry, very, very grateful and grateful for great students. And it allowed me, Kyle, to appreciate them even more. Mm -hmm. So all the stuff we've talked about before, there's like another level because there's a level of perspective. It's just like, I know I am truly lucky to be working with you. You know, I love it. And I said that often to my Mellophone kids is this summer, I'm honored. It's an honor to be teaching you. And I really, really did, did feel that and do feel that. Sweet. So do we have love some it. time for a few questions? We do. I've got, I've got a handful here that we want to get to some, no. some you wrote back to me about, but some here. So we'll, we'll do our best. Okay. Um, so Landon asks, um, what are some ways to teach students about performance anxiety? Um, one thing that I've done is first I teach them the physical part about dry mouth and how to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, some people say if you have water with a hint of citrus in it, that it helps, you know, if you drink that as you're performing, it helps not get dry mouth. You can also bite on the, with your molars on the outside of your tongue and it helps activate your salivary gland. I'll also say if kids want to sit versus standing to me, sitting made it less anxious because it takes like wobbly legs out of it. Yeah. Um, but past things like that, you have things like being really prepared, you know, that I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, that whole um, raft of things that you just had was actually not what I was thinking of, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I've learned some stuff today. Um, to me, it, it really does come in it, uh, some in the preparation, but some in what our approach is. And what I aimed for in, in my rehearsals was as calm a situation as, 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 as possible. Of course, we all get wound up about upcoming event, whether it's a festival or a yeah. con concert, or whatever. We all have all of this, this energy, and that like transfers in a way. And it's, it can be motivational on, on occasion, but if things are just like just very even, even keeled kind of thing, then kids are much less to, to, uh, to, to have that kind of anxiety. Cause I think some of the anxiety comes not only for, in terms of the individual performer, but just like wanting to do well after you've worked really hard. So a lot of it is, is setting expectations and being very, very straight, straight with them. And so what I would always say before, uh, uh concerts, uh, it's like, listen, First of all, we are as well prepared as you possibly can. I'm very pleased with what you, you've done. We've done everything we can to make this right. 
one of the things I tried to do in terms of rigging it for them was to make sure that all points of transition felt very, very comfortable. So mm -hmm. anything that's like iffy is, is removed kind of thing. So they can feel, and I can say you can feel perfectly calm and relaxed about this. But the other thing was important to point out that stuff is going to happen in a performance and that's perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I would always say to them, there's going to be something that's going to go sideways that it never has been a problem and we could do the concert five more times and it wouldn't be a problem it just cropped up then but also there's going to be stuff that we've never had quite right that all of a sudden in the performance is like yeah so you can't one way or the other just like get hung up in either of those and i would say when stuff happens i'm perfectly okay with that and we would do our concert reviews I would do precisely that because their reaction is going to be, oh, yeah, that transition or that whatever. It's like, I'm not upset about that in the least. And pointing out, as either Wooden or Vince Lombardi pointed out, that we pursue perfection, understanding that it's impossible. Both of those guys said that in, in different forms. But that's very true. We pursue this. We have this, this uh, great uh, desire to have everything be absolutely perfect. And that's great. If you have the perspective of saying, but that's impossible. And when people of that kind of quality is saying, giving us permission to handle things that way, yeah. I think what it does is it allows kids uh, to, to be a little bit more relaxed about it because it, that's the biggest performance anxiety thing that I have run into. It, yeah. The, what's the old quote? It's about the journey, not the destination, right? So it's about everything you've done, not just about the concert. Oh, yeah. And, and one thing that we, we talk about, too, in a case, it's like, you know, you realize that some of the, like the best playing that we do might very well have been in a rehearsal. Yep. And that's okay. A performance is a snapshot of our learning experience, our journey yeah. together. And as an older person, as a teacher, you can share with them, you know, I've, I had this great performance and then guess what? The sun rose the next day and I still had to keep working. Or I had a bad experience and the sun rose the next day and I had to keep working. So oh, giving I, them that, that view, the long view helps too. Yeah. And, you know, and I had a really juicy one happen. I, I was able to get through April of my last year of teaching and never ever having to stop a performance, ever. I was like, oh yeah, we're down the home stretch now. And this is beginning band, town band, anything else. So anyway, I'm, I'm doing a district festival, uh, district two jazz festival with a really good band and a drummer who ended up uh, uh, playing at uh, uh, USM. And this kid was a great, a great musician. We get into the middle of our last tune and the, and the gig had gone great. And it's in front of colleagues. Michelle Snow was doing one of the, the groups. Chris Oberholz was doing one of the groups. And I'm with the jazz band. And we're, we're playing Cottontail. And we get started. And uh, all of a sudden, it started to like go a little bit sideways. And it's like, oh, no, I can get them through it. I can get them through it. And at a certain point in time, I was like, nope. And so I just like turned to the audience and I said, uh, take two. And they started laughing and stuff like that. We went and started again. And it, it, it was fine. And it was just like, and so after like the kids are like, I said, I have no problem with that. Don't worry about that. We had a great week together, two thirds or three quarters of a great performance. That is like three seconds in time. Yep. That's all that is. All right. The next one, we have a, a couple questions from Dan. One thing Dan wanted, actually wanted to mention is what we're looking for in selecting appropriate music for your band. Um, and I think a lot of us have, have heard about, you know, quality repertoire that demands certain things of them um, and all that, um, that it's not too hard, not too easy. But he actually wrote, and I actually wanted to just read this to everybody because I thought he did it well, things that he thinks about that a lot of younger teachers don't think about. Um, thinking along more the lines of technical demand, range issues, the amount of downtime or resting for younger levels, um, rhythmic issues, expressive content, and balancing issues. So thinking about all of those things, I think are really important. One thing that helps with me, I look at the downtime and resting for younger levels. Um, when you look at a new piece and you're at the vendor and you have the whole piece, look at the actual music the kids are playing. Don't just look at the score. Because if you look at the piece the way they see it, you might go, oh, I wouldn't want to play that piece on the thir on third trumpet. So I might, I might can that. Well, you never, you may never notice that. There's a great piece I've done. I'm not going to mention it because I like the piece. The trombone parts are terrible, <laughs> but it's this great famous piece. It's on all these lists and it's a really cool piece to play and conduct. If you were playing in the trombone section, you would not want to be a part of it. Oh, absolutely. And looking at 
uh, the music from the viewpoint of the of the uh, performer, particularly it it point uh, five grade one that particular level. A lot of times is it, it's functional, yeah. and, but think in terms of keeping a kid engaged. You know, if if the lick for like you know seven years is da 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 da, you know, that's not going to engage them. So I I look for for creative part writing and creative counterpoint. It doesn't have to be necessarily very involved, but like interactions between voices. So to be looking for pieces that can be conversational, because sometimes it's concerted in the. Uh, the more basic the literature gets, the more concerted it tends to be. So I tend to be looking at uh, a counterpoint aspects of things, dyma- dynamic uh, uh, demands, rather than it does not have to be at a single dynamic for like an entire piece. A lot of times uh, uh, composers and publishers more, more the deal uh, underestimate a little bit what kids can do. And so you just want to make sure that you're doing uh, yeah. looking along those lines. And when I'm when I'm choosing lit, one thing I, I imagine is if everybody just imagines a circle and inside it are all the things your kids can do. And then I just think of choosing music that is basically that circle, only 10% bigger all around. And in that way, you know, you're stretching them, but you're still keeping most of the things inside that circle. Absolutely. Okay. So Thomas asked, this is going to be a marching band question. How do you balance cleaning the music and drill you have, um, sorry, you have on the field and adding elements like body, closer drill um, during this time of season? Okay. So I'm going to jump in real quick with closer drill. Like I'm an, I'm, I'm adamant. We learn our whole show as quick as possible. Even if the music isn't great, like we have a two week band camp, we try to learn the show and we're not going to get bogged down that the opener is not finals perfection. Like we need stuff to work on. So to me, kids really like it when they can learn the whole show and we leave a lot of body and extra stuff out because what that does I've learned over the season is you then get to spice up the show and create more and more as it goes on. So they get new stuff every week too. Yep. When I, when I taught in uh, Biddeford, we had a very similar format to what you do. And at the end of uh, Bandcamp. We would always have a family and friends day it was a, was a cookout. Invariably, we were able to finish the show, do a full run through of the show at that p- particular performance. And it was great because it really kept us on task. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole idea of, of entering a season with an incomplete production, sometimes, mm-hmm. yes, you do have to do that. I've taught drum clothes that have done that. It does not work to their benefit. Trust me, it's better to have things in a formative stage with performance in in the early part of the season, but to have the complete thought so that judges can evaluate the entire product product rather than, okay, this is upcoming kind of of thing. And so that's like one thing. And then as far as like the, the addition of body and all that kind of stuff, so much of this comes to the planning aspect of it. Um, I would think that in the early part of the season, because this whole thing is going more and more and more and more and more towards the choreography end of Mus- things. Musical theater on the field. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's a great thing. When we started in drum corps, uh, and I was teaching at that point in time, we've, we've got to, oh, we've got to do this dance. Uh, now kids join the activity because they love it, and they're really good at yeah. it, and it's a great way to express themselves. So to me, as far as the, the movement, the choreography aspect of things, uh, from a visual viewpoint, I would think of a visual block, but I would also think as part of that visual block at the beginning of rehearsal would be some uh, some uh, uh, choreography stuff, uh, some basic dance steps that they're going to be using, and that's part of their vocabulary. And do it to a soundtrack, so it's fun for them. You, you could, yes, yep. I think that's a great idea. And so, but then in the early part of the season, a little bit of of body rather than okay, we're throwing all this in, and then it's how you plan your season. So for me, if it's a six week season, you start, you do the first show, it's a complete show. uh, And with some choreo, uh, and then with each succeeding week, you add and add and add. And that what that does is from a judging viewpoint, also says, okay, oh, there's more here that I haven't seen before. Well, yeah, because it hasn't been there. And uh, but you can you can get that kind of growth and provide more and more detail then at a certain point in time it's got to be stopped and we're just going to clean it so for me it would be the first four weeks being the first show and then uh like with each week 
adding more, but to get it all mapped out, how you're going to do it, this mm -hmm. would be Jeff Smith 101. He's not going to yeah. do it according to, well, we'll throw this stuff in whenever. It's all laid out there. And the planning process yeah. is critical. And then for me, the last two weeks of the season being real in terms of we're digging in, cleaning big time because it's got to be squeaky squeaky clean one thing we do near the end too is we deal with moment to moment we might be like okay here's a big hit moment we're gonna do the next 40 seconds until the next maybe moment or 30 seconds when that when that happens and for us we call those performance moments and that's less about the i mean we're still doing chalk we're still doing intonation we're still doing details but we're thinking about how do we relate to the audience more and more the, the emotional trajectory is 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 a real challenge particularly if, if it's a long build because it's got to be so measured you know we, we had uh, a couple of those in in cold show last summer particularly the in the first movement it was it was really beautiful but it was tricky because it had to be like more and more and more incrementally kind mm -hmm. of thing and it's got to be seamless at that point in time so building into those moments yeah the big moments are important and in the first week in the season those have got to be right it's the build into that the creating the tension dynamically and yep. and everything else that's got to be right for that effect to be truly maximized uh, yeah. in, in the end. Last thing I'll say on this subject is, um, you talked about the the agenda, the the band camp performance, have an agenda for your camp before you start that the whole staff knows about. So you know, on Thursday, we're learning sets 28 through 40 or 28 through 32 or whatever it is for you. So you have that micro plan, you're basically lesson planning those. And if you get ahead, then you get ahead. Um, and then lastly, like play, if your band camp's gonna be a performance on Friday, like what we do, I plan to be ready for Thursday sure. because this was two years in a row, Friday was rain. So it's like, rather than not doing it or doing something inside, we did it one day earlier, um, you know, and just puts you in a better position. You know, if you're talking about process, uh, those of you who subscribe to the instrumentalists really need to see uh, something that's in there, uh, the uh, August edition of that, and it is a, uh, interview with a bunch of uh, judges, uh, but one of whom is uh, Jeff Smith uh, from uh, Westbrook, and he really lays out uh, in very specific detail uh, the, the show planning process, how it's all done, how to handle critiques, all of that stuff, because in any of it, it's really the, the plan is going to be the success of the group or not success of the group. As a judge, I can tell from show one if there has been a strong planning process. Yep. And if there hasn't been, it's really obvious. And then the group is playing uh, uh, catch up the entire the entire season. Uh, that is not a great use of students a time and the best staffs operate in a very contrary fashion to that. Okay, Gary asks how to quote unquote, adjust your sales as the direction of the winds change adopt adapting as things grow and morph. Uh, adapting is is like the essence of of what we do kids change administrations change uh, tastes change all that stuff change and to be really really uh, almost having your finger to the wind and saying okay this is the direction that this is going uh educationally do i agree with it and if i do then to pursue it if you don't it's like okay how do we work our way around it because we need to continue to stay relevant and there are just some things that it's just like oh i'm not really crazy about that trends but you know you you uh ended up adapting i think that you have to be adaptable in that uh situation there's a couple uh analogies come to mind one yeah. atl we're gonna drive to walmart now from here to walmart there's like 64 different ways we could go so we might have our prescribed way, but we could also go a different route and still end up at the same place. So I think that's important. You have to know where you want your kids to go and if you need to take a different route to do it. Also, not to not to pander to kids, but you know, if you've ever fed, you know, vegetables to a child, <laughs> like you there's ways to go around about things. As long as you're being educationally sound and the your ultimate goal is still the same, then I think, you know, do anything you need to. You know, as with kids and vegetables, you have to be creative. <laughs> uh, okay. Timothy asks, how to include special ed students in your program? I had an interesting, I, I, I didn't have like a ton of sped kids. Um, I, I did have one kid uh, that uh, played trumpet in the band and he, and he was blind and uh, very interesting. I had him for a couple of years. He never, ever made a mistake on a timing entrance. And I didn't count off the bands, but seldom. 
he never ever did. He had a system worked out with his buddies next to him. The split second before the downbeat, they would just tap him on the arm. He would always be ready. And it's just like, because he was so sensitive to other aspects that didn't involve sight. So I found that that really was really interesting. Um, I, I think, as I recall, he learned his music by Braille, or he might have learned it by ear. I'm not, I don't recall. But that was an interesting thing. And the, the other aspect of it that I, I, I had a number of Asperger's kids. And uh, until I encountered that, it was, I, did, I was not really aware of it. A lot of times, guidance departments, uh, they're much better at it now, but it used to be you would have a, 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 a kid with special needs in your group. You had no idea. Mm -hmm. And it might be like he might have a, 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 an ADD situation and you're just thinking he's a, a or she's not a very nice person or a good student rather than, hey, there are reasons. Mm -hmm. And it might be that this kid is not on their meds or, or, or whatever. The, uh, dealing with Asperger's kids, I found really, really interesting because I got very, very sensitive or much more sensitive as to social interactions and how uh, careful you needed to be in some situation. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times uh, you couldn't even tell that the kid any, had any sort of a, a situation going on, but to be made aware of that. And that's why it's critical that you have con uh, contact and conversations with your um, uh, guidance people and say, so what exactly are we dealing with here? Because it comes to classroom management, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, it comes to the need of that particular student. Yeah. And it depends on the level of their disability, right? I yeah, mean, yes. the kids who are not functional in a group setting, well, that they're going to be a hard kid to have in a full band setting, yep. but you can offer other things for them to be able to participate in music. Yes. But, mm -hmm. but really, the big thing is getting them to be part of the group. Yes. Right. And given and many times, you know, some systems like to take them out of things like band because they need extra services, whereas where they really need to be is band because that gives them lots of things that help them. Precisely. Yeah. All right. We're going to do one more. This sure. one's from Amber. Um, uh, we're looking for some tips in surviving the first year connecting with students as a new teacher in the school. I think a lot of what we talked about with connection yep. is the same as for a new teacher as well. Um, AI and surviving the mid-year slump. Um, <laughs> there's, there's like a lot of stuff in there. Um, first of all, surviving the first year, you know, I, I remember being told, you know, it's four years till it's really your band. You know, I'm not sure that's the case, but you know, people have to have the long-term vision, like do your best your first year, but every year you're going to feel like you have a little bit more and more control over what's happening. Okay, so this is TL number two. Everyone is terrible in the beginning. Yep. Um, when I got into uh, teaching, I, I had taught drum corps for about 10 years. Then I went to music school. And the first uh, time that uh, I taught in a public school situation was in Norwood, down in Massachusetts, a good program. Uh, I was succeeding someone who had been there a, a long time. He was director of music and did things a very, very particular kind of way. And he expected me to do them the same way. And uh, it, it, uh, it almost killed me, <laughs> or it almost killed them. The, the, the first year I was not very good at all. And I'm saying, but I'm so experienced. Well, dealing with drum corps kids is different it's than different. Deal, yeah. dealing with public school kids. And I made a lot, a lot of mistakes that first year. And with each, and I can remember after my first year, it's like, I'm 51%, I'm gonna do this one more year. And that's after I had given up another career to, to be a music teacher. And 49% no. And then like my second year, it was, you know, like 75% yes, 25% no. And then when I got a few more years into it, it's like, like a 99% yes, 1% no. Those uh, percentages change the more that, that you get. If you can survive the, the, the first year uh, in those challenges, because in dealing with a whole group of human beings, you know, there's a lot of variables. And there are a lot yep. of stuff that you don't know ways and you have to develop your own way in terms of classroom management and stuff like that. It's not like being in a college band where everyone is pretty well behaved. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a different situation. That's tough to, to, to grasp. And I think there's a reason that so many teachers leave after just a few years. And that's unfortunate because that's then the time after three or four years, then you start to feel uh, you know, you have a little bit of a grasp on it, certainly not total grasp, but there's the confidence. It's like, okay, I think I can do this for a living kind of thing. That's, that's uh, tough. The, the mid-year slump kind of thing is really in terms of like you getting yourself revived. 
And for me, one of the things that really solved my mid-year slump, if I had one, was going to the Midwest Band Clinic. And I come back and I'm batteries are recharged and stuff like that. If you're recharged, they'll be recharged. The other thing you can do is start to play around with some techniques. One of the things that I would do on occasion is they would come in and the whole band room would be set up where all of the, all of the chairs are up against the four walls. And uh, the percussion is off to the side kind of thing. And it's like, and I, I'd say to them, you can sit anywhere you want today. Sit next to your friends, whatever kind of thing, to change things up. Um, and uh, so to use different techniques to make it be like a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, new, or, uh, obviously introducing them to some new music or some listening things to just change it up in, in some way so that they don't feel I walk in every single day. It's the same warm up. It's the same. This is the same that and, change, change that up. And to, and to me, one of the things that's been huge for me is having more performances. Like every six weeks, my band kids are doing a performance. So, I mean, yes, there's still that. But it's like, hey, we got a gig in three weeks. You know, it, there's nothing to me harder than it's January fifth, and you're not performing till June. Like to me, that's so. I think your your concert schedule has a lot to do with it too. There's great wisdom to to that. If I were to do this in another life, I think I would adapt wow, that. I idea. know something. Um, I, <laughs> lastly, I'll say Amber, and for anybody else who's interested in that, in episode 104, I had Lindsay Boys and Crystal Smith with me. Um, lesson plan for wellness. We had an an issue with the audio, but still, if you can listen to it, it's great. You know, talking about sleep eating right, exercise, and keeping balance in life, um, no matter what time of year it is, will help you a lot. So, T, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure for me, too. Thank you very much. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.